Good morning, Crossview. It's a great day to worship together. Uh, we feel the anticipation of the weeks to come, remembering each day um, the reason we have hope. Our King Jesus came to earth. He came to save us, and God had a plan to bring us back to him. And we can stand here in this room together, having been given the gift that is Jesus. There is no greater gift and no other hope than, than Jesus. So let's stand and praise him together with glad and hope-filled hearts. today with joy about the birth of Jesus our Savior King because his coming was for us and his mighty work among us gives eternal hope to us. Today's scripture today is Isaiah 9 6 for a child will be born for us a son will be given to us and the government will be on his shoulders he will be named wonderful counselor mighty God eternal father prince of peace Let's continue to bow our hearts together and worship before our Savior. Love incarnate, love divine, star and angels gave the sign. Bow to babe on bended. The Savior of humanity. Unto us a child is born. He shall reign forevermore. No Come and see what God.
God, would we be awakened to the depth of your love for us and in awe that we can stand here praising you with clean hearts, redeemed only by your son, Jesus. The light of the world given for us, a gift we couldn't earn, a burden we don't have to bear. It was your perfect plan of salvation. Would your words that are alive and active breathe new life into us today, no matter how familiar they may seem? And would you draw our whole selves closer to you? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. I'm Jed, the pastor of Group Life. So good to be with you, Crossview and beyond, in person and online. We're so glad you're joining us. Hey, just want to draw your attention to a few things, uh, some announcements. Uh, If it's your first time here, we're so glad you're here, and we would love for you, if you're in person, to stop by our Welcome Center on your way out. We have a gift for you. If you're online, we have a moderator. Say hi to us and ask any questions as well. We're, We're so glad you're joining us. All right, we have a Church Center app on our uh, phones. You can take that out right now. Go ahead and download it. Uh, Church Center app, find us, Crossview Church, and you'll see all that I'm going to say today on that app. For giving at Crossview, you can give right on that app. We have a website you can give online at, uh, crossviewrapids.org. Or and, and on your way out, there's some black boxes. You can drop your uh, do, uh, do, tithes and offerings in there, or feel free to mail it in, all right? We have a Jesus Storybook devotional. This is really cool. Uh, it is amazing. Ambriel rocked it this week. You've got to check that out if you're a family or anybody, right, for that matter. It is an amazing little devotional that drops on Saturdays on our Facebook pages, Crossview Kids and Crossview Church, and you can get there from the app as well. It's Christmas season, and Apex students are getting together for their Christmas party, which is so exciting. It's uh, this Wednesday, 6 to 8, only $15. You get the theater in Wisconsin Rapids, Rogers Theater, to yourself, and it's going to be a blast. So we're watching Elf, we're giving games, prizes, all kinds of things, ugly sweater contest. You do not want to miss out. Join us for that. Sign up online. We have some extra giving opportunities as well because you're never more like Jesus than when you give and when you serve. And so we have some extra opportunities because Jesus is the reason for this season, right? So in person, we have nine tags left on our giving tree. On your way out, make sure you grab a tag. Bring those presents back by next Sunday the 20th. That'd be great. If you're online, we have an opportunity for you too. Feel free to go to your local food pantry. Just load it up, right? And if you're in Wisconsin Rapids, we support SWEPS, and we would love for you to donate there. If you want to stay safe and in your home, we have a team who can come to your house and pick up your donations and deliver it for you. You just have to register online by the 18th. The team will come out on the 22nd and pick up all those donations and drop them off at SWEPS. Please join us in doing that. We have end of the year giving as well. This end of the year giving, we're doing a 50-50. So we're supporting our Crossview missionaries, up in our support for them to, to make sure their needs are met during this pandemic and hard season. But we're also partnering with Compassion International. Hurricane Etta destroyed, uh, did some damage, major damage, in uh, Honduras. And we are coming alongside of uh, relief efforts and churches there to help support the people. Please join us in helping with those efforts. We are going to have Christmas Eve. I'm so excited for Christmas. Are you excited? I am excited. It's because it's my birthday on Christmas. So, hey, hey. but also it's about Jesus, right? So, uh, we are going to celebrate Jesus together on Christmas Eve, 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. Online and in person. We would love to have you join us wherever 
you are at. Just want to give you a quick update on Pastor Dan as well. He's on the road to recovery, praise Jesus, and uh, he's doing well, but keep praying for him. We hope to have him back in the saddle soon, and so his family is, is, is recovered and doing well, so that's a praise report there. It is Advent, and we're on our third week of Advent, and the theme today is joy. I love this theme, joy. Actually, one of my really good friends who, who passed away is with Jesus. He is the epitome of joy. Jesus, others, yourself. Jesus, others, yourself. Oh, we get to have joy. Check this out. Luke 2.10, it says, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you great news of great joy that will be for all people. Jesus is the reason for the season. We can have joy in the midst of every circumstance because of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus, that he paid the price so we could have life, eternal life with you. May we just radiate this joy that we get to have to others around us this season in the midst of this hard time. We thank you for the work that you're doing in, in, in healing the Deroshi family, and, and we pray that you would continue to be with Pastor Dan and give him your joy in the midst of this circumstance. Give us all your joy in the midst of the circumstances going on around us. We commit this morning to joy. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Please stand as we continue to worship. A king like this, majesty laying in a manger. A king like this, Unto us is born a Savior, the light, the light has come. A king like this, the highest name and the song of heaven. A king like this, born of flesh into our suffering, the light, the light. He is Christ the Lord. He is Christ our Savior. I bow my heart before no other name. I bow my heart before A saving love that would not forsake us Betrayed by a kiss And led to the cross for our forgiveness The light, the light has come He is Christ the Lord He is Christ
voice that will stand forever the angels sing glory glory hallelujah the light the light has come the light the light has come you guys can have a seat I want to tell you guys a story. It's a Christmas story. It's a story about two brothers, an optimist and a pessimist. Now, this optimist, they always saw the positive side of things, uh, even when it's unrealistic. Whereas the pessimist, equally unrealistic, always saw the glass half empty, the negative side of life. Now, Christmas was coming up, and the parents, they were concerned about these boys, and they were concerned about the extremes of kind of their perspectives, and so they decided to come up with an experiment to see if they could level out these extremes a little bit. Surely, this would be a good plan, right? So Christmas rolled around, and, and to the pessimist, they would give him exactly what he wanted for Christmas, and to the optimist, they'd give him something that nobody wanted. So as Christmas is, it's Christmas morning and, and they're opening up their gifts and the pessimist takes this giant box, this large box, and he starts opening it and the parents watch excitedly as, as he opens up this brand new, expensive, shiny new bike. And they're like waiting to see him smile and lo and behold, frown. He's sad. I'm like, well, what's wrong? I thought this is exactly what you wanted. And he said, well, yeah, it's just, it's just so nice, and I'm probably going to break it and break a knee while I'm doing it. And the parents go, oh, okay. Like, they kind of like, well, at least we have the other boy. Let's, let's see what, what, what happens with him. And so the optimist, he starts opening up his gift, this carefully wrapped, uh, ornately wrapped box of manure. <laughs> He starts opening. It looks puzzled, uh, rightfully so. He looks down, and then before long, he jumps up screaming excitedly, and he starts running towards the door, and he grabs his coat, and he puts it on, and the parents go, whoa, 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 hold on. What's going on? And the voice says, you can't fool me. Where there's this much manure, there's got to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> My name's Kale. I'm the director of student ministry, and uh, that probably explains why I told you a manure joke right at the beginning of this sermon. Uh, but why did I tell you that joke? Well, partly because uh, I thought it was funny, but also because I wanted to bring up this idea. You see, when I fill this cup halfway with a liquid, now, everyone's going to describe it one way or another, right? Like, and depending on how you describe this, apparently is going to tell us something about your personality, right? Like, are you a glass half full type of person or are you a glass half empty type of person? An optimist or a pessimist? And I think the question that we should ask when we see this glass is, is what should the Christian be? What should the Jesus follower be? Not, not specifically about the glass, but just life in general. Like, what should the Jesus follower do? Now, I feel, I feel like pessimism is kind of off the table a little bit, right? Like, for while we were still sinners, the Bible said Christ died for us, and, and also for it is a gift you have been saved through grace. It's not of yourself. So it seems like, well, we had this negative future, but Jesus, God decided to step into it and give us a positive outlook. So it feels like pessimism is off the table. But at the same time, doesn't it seem like sometimes in certain circumstances, optimism is off the table as well. Because if you start to think about it, so there's 12 disciples. After Judas betrayed Jesus, he was replaced by Matthias. And when he was replaced, out of those 12 disciples, 11 of them would be executed, would be martyred for their faith, whether it was being stoned, clubbed, beheaded, crucified. They would be killed in some way. And the one person who wasn't, who died, quote-unquote, naturally, he died on an island, stranded, because the Roman emperor put him there for their faith. And so he didn't get off easy either, right? And also, if you're familiar with your Bible, you also know that the last book, Revelation, seems to state that things are going to get, in some ways, worse before they get better. And so the question I think we have to ask is, what kind of worldview do we adapt from these two options? Let me make it a little more personable. See, in 2007, 
my mom, uh, she was 50, and, and she went into the doctor for some headaches and some double vision issues that she was having. And she was a healthy woman, she was very healthy, and, but apparently that didn't matter because the doctors told her that she actually had stage four brain cancer. And that brain cancer had moved to her lymph nodes and had moved to her lungs, and it pretty much gone everywhere at this point. The doctors would give her an estimated two months left to live. So the question is, like, how would you ask that person to be optimistic in that scenario? Right? Like, optimism almost seems naive at this point. These circumstances point towards pessimism, yet at the same time, if you ever knew my mom, you would know that she was anything but pessimistic. But I wouldn't say that she was unrealistic about her cancer. She knew the reality of what it was doing to her body as well. So I ask again, what kind of worldview should we, as the Jesus followers, adopt? Or other way put is, how can we respond when things around us seem so dark? Some of you are thinking right now, like, wow, aren't we week two into a Christmas series? Like, Kale, this is a little, little heavy, right? Like, don't worry, we're, we're about to turn a corner. But I'm just, I'm trying to problematize this for you. Problematize this question, like, what is, like, what should we have as a Jesus follower? Because I believe the Bible has an answer. And I think it's a third option. A third option that the Bible would define as hope. Hope. You see, there's this organization called Bible Project, and they have a video on this topic. It's simply titled Hope. Uh, I totally encourage you to Google it when you go home. Uh, it's, it's a great video, and it's awesome. Um, but they describe biblical hope this way. They say, Biblical hope is different than optimism because optimism is choosing to see how in any situation things could work out for the best. But biblical hope doesn't focus on circumstances. Rather, it's a choice to wait and trust in a God who has proven his faithfulness to us through what he's already done. In other words, hope isn't just optimism based on the odds. It's, it's a choice. Biblical hope chooses to focus on the work and the character and the promises of God instead. And I think that's what the writer was going for when he wrote or when he penned the verses that we're going to be looking at today, some of which are the most uh, famous Christmas verses uh, that you might even have on your, on your um, fridge or hanging on your tree. Like I have one right here. It's really little writing, so I guarantee you can't read it. But it is from Isaiah chapter 9. And then usually we talk about verses 6 uh, together. But we are week two in a series called The Gift God Gave, Expect the Unexpected. And this is where we're looking through some of these famous Christmas verses together. And like I said, today we'll be looking at Isaiah chapter 9. But before we go there, let's jump into prayer together. So I invite you to bow your heads with me. God, I pray today that you would be able to speak uh, through each and every one of us, God, just in a way uh, that only your Holy Spirit can do. God, I pray uh, that you would perform miracles uh, in us just as you did in the past, that you would change hearts, that you would change minds, and point us all towards you just a little bit better. God, I pray that you would teach us something new today. In your name, Jesus. Amen. So again, look, if you want to turn together with me in your Bibles, or turn on your Bibles if you've got them in your pockets, that's cool too. We're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. I'll give you a second to turn there with me. Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. So verse 1, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, verse 1 starts out this way. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. All right, pack up. You guys are set to go. If you're watching the video, you can turn it off because we feel warm and fuzzy after that verse, don't we? We feel good. It totally made sense. And we're set to put it up on the fridge and hang it up and quote it on our Facebooks, right? No, <laughs> like that was a confusing verse. It's dark and it's weird and broody and strange and they have words that we don't understand like Zebulon and Naphtali. Like what is going on in this verse? 
Welcome to the book of Isaiah, okay? Welcome to Isaiah. See, Isaiah is filled with things like this because what Isaiah is doing is he is basically, he's, he's a commentator on the things of his time while also being the voice box for God. He's speaking the words of God to the people of Israel, the Israelites, um, but he's also talking about things that are going on in his day. It's kind of like if we were to start doing a theology lesson and talking about COVID-19 and 2,000 years later, we're reading about it and we're like, unless we were history buffs and knew exactly about COVID-19, we'd be like, what are they talking about? That's, what, that's what's happening here in Isaiah. See, Isaiah lived in a really, really tough time for Israel. He lived in a time where they were on the verge of being totally wiped out and annihilated by their northern enemies called the Assyrians. Now, he was mentioning an event that happened specifically to two of these cities, Zebulon and Naphtali. These were cities that were, uh, quote-unquote, humbled by God. That's a poetic and fancy way of saying God let them be leveled out by their enemies. And so they were completely taken out. Um, and Isaiah had warned them about this in previous writings. He knew that this was going to happen. So let's think about it in our, in our perspective. Uh, it's, imagine it was Wisconsin, right? And so the Canadians decide to come down and take out Marshfield and Mosini. And they're starting to take over. And you have family out there. And they are being taken up to, like, back, back to Canada. And they're now learning how to ice skate and ride moose right? Like that is what uh, is going on. Now, of course, that seems silly to us because we have to imagine what it looked like for Canada to do that. But, but you know, like this is not, like this is the reality for what happened to Isaiah, just with oh, the moose and hockey pucks and stuff, right? But this is what was going on. And, and Isaiah describes it as gloom and rough, as difficult. But to Isaiah, like, is this, is this the end? Destruction from the Canadians, I mean, Assyrians. Is it the end for him? And Isaiah says, no. No, God is faithful to his promises. He is faithful to his people. Yes, yes, they are experiencing the consequences for their decisions, but he also describes them, uh, this, this is being what happened in the past. Because in the future, God is going to honor this exact area, this very area. In the verse we read, he said specifically, God will bring honor to the land east of the Jordan and to Galilee. Uh, but it's kind of like referring to the previous location that we said. Uh, it's kind of like if I were to say um, to the land south of the Mosini flowage and in Marathon County or something like that, right? Like that, that is what he's doing when he's referring, when he's referring to that. Now, that's a lot of background. I get that, right? Like, we're, there's a lot of nerdy background going on there, but I think it's important to know because in verse 1, he describes this, and it's important for us to realize why verses 2 through 9 are actually so incredible because Isaiah is recognizing that at this point in Israel's history, it is a difficult time. It's a dark, dark place. They have no reason to be optimistic in their time. In fact, in future passages, Isaiah is going to warn them that things are going to get quite a bit worse before they get better. But it doesn't matter because he gave them this vision of hope anyway. Something for them to cling onto. Something to have hope in. But don't take my word for it. Let's look at the verses together. So let's jump back in to verse number two. Uh, and Isaiah starts to dream of this hopeful future, uh, this future that he can, we can have hope in. So talking about that, he says this, verse two. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned for those living in the darkness. Like we said, it's a hard time for Israel. And for them, it feels like the lights have been shut off, that God had turned, it, turned them off. They feel lost and they feel abandoned. Have you ever felt this way? That's what the Israelites would have felt. Does God care? Has he left us? And Isaiah says, God has not left you. God does care. God is faithful, and he is about to flip the switch. The sun is about to rise, and there is going to be light again. You can have hope. And as the audience, we think, like, okay, that sounds great. What's that going to look like? Isaiah, what does it mean for God to start turning on these switches? What will that be? And so in this vision of the future, Isaiah says... 
You, talking about God, have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. Okay, so Isaiah, he's piling on the metaphors at this point, right? Like he's, he's adding a whole bunch of metaphors and he's saying uh, whatever God turning on the light is, like whatever it's going to look like for God to turn on the light, apparently it means that Israel's borders are going to increase or maybe uh, that whoever God's people is, the family is going to grow. It's going to grow beyond this original space. When God flips the switch and the light turns on, it's going to spread throughout the nation and throughout the world. And this light is going to reach far and wide. And this space, God's family, is going to expand. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be better. And it's going to be joyous. How joyous is it? Isaiah says, well, it's like people who rejoice at harvest time. It's people who've labored and toiled and worked for months and tons of time, and now it's finally harvest time, and they get to rejoice because it's here, and they're receiving the fruits of this labor. They're receiving something. He says it's like people, like warriors who are dividing spoils, people who are dividing treasures. It's, there's victory in this image, and it's saying they get to divide this treasure. It's like, it's like receiving a gift. It's receiving a gift for that. And people, it's going to be a time to rejoice. But he's not finished. Isaiah continues on even further. He says, for you, again to God, you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders the staff of their oppressor, just like you did on the day of Midian. So here, Isaiah, he's saying that God is going to release his people from captivity, from, from some kind of oppression, op- oppression, slavery to their enemies, just like he did in the past. He talks about the day of Midian, uh, which is an Old Testament story. You can find it in Judges 6 and 7 if you're interested later. Uh, And it's a story where God shows up in a huge way to help Israel beat the armies when all the cards were stacked against them. In fact, they won by, with just torches and a couple pots and pans to bang, and they beat this entire army of the, of, of this, of the Midianites. And so God, whatever it looks like, he's saying God has done it before in the past. And he'll do it again. We will receive freedom. We'll receive freedom from oppression. Isaiah continues on. He says, For every trampling boot of battle and bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. Now, this one seemed weird to me reading at first. I'm like, what, what does that mean? That's, that sounds strange and dark, and, and it caught me off guard. But it's actually quite beautiful when you think about it. Because Isaiah is describing these garments worn in battle, things that have become bloodied and, and they're, they're the past garments of this time and in battle. And he says, those things are no longer needed. Burn them to ash. or fuel for the fire now. Like those things are gone. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Now is a time for rest from your enemy. Now is time for rest and peace. You don't need that stuff anymore. Fuel for the fire. Okay, Isaiah, we are sold, right? Like, that sounds amazing. It's beautiful. That sounds great. But you haven't told us how yet. You haven't told us how this is actually going to happen. You told us more about what's going, how, what the effects of this are going to be happening, but what is actually going to happen? Tell us, how is God going to turn on the light again? And Isaiah tells us exactly. And is crescendoing his message. You almost expect him to start shouting at this point because it's so exciting. There's so much going on. And he starts, he gets to the point and he's, it's like he speaks quietly. He says this, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Well, that was unexpected. And Isaiah's like, yeah, expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected because God is not coming down to demolish with with fire and lightning. Instead, Isaiah speaks of a baby, a child, a son. And that son is going to be given to us. And that son, that child, is God turning back on the lights for his people. He's the one who's going to bring the joy and the harvest. He's the one who's going to be bringing victory and peace and rest to all of us. This little baby the king who bears authority. He bears a government on his shoulders. He bears rule and reign of a kingdom 
on his shoulders. Isaiah continues, he says, His name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Okay, so when we see that word wonderful counselor, don't picture some like therapist sitting in the corner crossing his knees, like telling you some, some things you should do in your life that'll make it better. No, no, no. Think of a, like a war general who's in the room with you creating strategy. His wonderful words will win the battle for you. This is what he means when he says this counselor, a wonderful counselor. But he continues on even further than that because he starts to call this child mighty God an eternal father. This human child, like, like Isaiah, is it human or is he God? And, and Isaiah says, yes. Yeah, you're getting it. Both. Both of those things. He is the fulfillment of God's plan. He is the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. He is going to rescue the entire world. He's the prince of peace. He's not only going to remove conflict for us, but he's also going to bring unity and harmony. The Hebrew word here, shalom, implies friendship and, and community. He's going to bring all of that. This, and Isaiah continues on, he says, the dominion or his rule will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David, which is a Hebrew phrase meaning he'll be the true king. Uh, he'll reign as the th- on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness, meaning he will make all wrongs right from now on and forever. The zeal or the intense passion of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. This is what the Israelites have to look forward to. This is what they can have to hope in. It's different than optimism. Remember, the Israelites have no reason to be optimistic in their time. We already said earlier that things are going to get worse for Israel before they actually get better. And Isaiah knows that. But he still paints this beautiful picture of hope for them to cling on to anyway. He says, despite their circumstances, God is a God who is faithful. He is faithful to them, and he will never, ever abandon them. And for that reason, they can cling on to hope. He says, even when things don't feel great, when things aren't great, you can still celebrate. Because you have hope. You have hope. You guys, I don't think it's coincidence that the Magi were led to Jesus uh, in the dark of night by a shining bright star that had appeared in the sky. I don't think it's coincidence that Jesus came saying, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus was and is God turning back on the lights for humanity. He is the light. You guys, the lights are on for Christmas now, right? Like that's why we still celebrate that's why we celebrate Christmas in the first place. That's why when, even when things aren't great, we can still celebrate because of a child who would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Eternal Father. This is why we have hope. He is the source of hope. Amen? Amen. But there's one more passage I want us to look at before we apply this to our lives and we conclude today. And it's found in Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 12 through 17. I'll have this one on the screen if you want, but you can turn there if you want. Matthew 4, 12 through 17. See, in the Gospel of Matthew, these verses mark the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's when he, uh, he had just got finished with the tempting in the wilderness, and now he's about to go out and start delivering the good news of the kingdom of God, otherwise sometimes referred to as the kingdom of heaven, as in this verse. So let's read together in verse uh, 12 through 13. It says, When he, that's Jesus, first heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. Okay, that should sound familiar, right? Like, that should sound pretty familiar. Like, wait, we, we know those places. We've heard about those places. We were talking about those already. But he continues on. He says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Okay, more familiar, right? Land of Zebulon, land of Naphtali, along the road by the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Okay, come now, that is familiar, right? Like, that sounds familiar. We just read that. 
Matthew's quoting the very beginning of the passage that we just read. He says, the Galilee of the Gentiles, Gentiles is another, is a, another way to say of the nations. And so he's saying the exact same verse all the way through. And so what he's doing, he's saying, this is the space. This is the place. Remember uh, this area? God said that would eventually experience honor at some point. Apparently, when Matthew tells his story, apparently this is where Jesus began his ministry, when he started flipping on the switches of light. Like, this is the place that he started. What an honor for that, those cities, right? Isn't that amazing? Like, that's where this message begins. But if we have Isaiah's whole passage uploaded to our brains, then we should be expecting, at this point, is where Jesus is going to go around starting flipping on the switches for everyone, right? Like, this is where the light should be coming, this dawn of time, like the dawn of light, the sun. But Matthew tells us, he tells us exactly how Jesus goes about flipping the switches. He says, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Because from then on, Jesus went around delivering the good news. He started going around telling people, come back to God. Turn back towards God, because his kingdom, it's here, and it is now, and you are invited. Turn back to God. Come back. This good news. See, Isaiah, he looked back at the victories of God, like in the day of Midian, in order for to look forward to a hopeful future. In the same way, we, as Jesus followers, we get to look back at the victories of Jesus on the cross in order that we can look forward. We get to see what Jesus has already done. We get to look back at the empty tomb where we get to see where Jesus defeated death in order that we look forward to a day when God will do it again for our, for our lives. Not only so, but we also look forward to a day that all of creation would be liberated from sin and death. Paul says it this way. He says, in the hope that creation itself will be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. This is why we don't have hope in our circumstances. Don't listen to any message that tells you that your life is going to become a whole lot easier when you become a Christian or that circumstances are going to become simple. Like, no, that's not biblical. That's a false gospel. Don't believe that. Uh, instead, we have hope in the person of Jesus, the same Jesus who chose to enter into a darkness with us. He chose to enter into a world full of sin and death. And he chose to take on the penalty to himself. And he became the light of life. This is why we can say, even when things aren't great, you, you can still celebrate because you have hope. You have hope. Now, I shared a story at the beginning um, about my mom. You see, at the beginning, she, like we said, she had no reason to be optimistic in her circumstances, Right? She had every reason to be pessimistic, no hope for optimism in what was going on. Yet I watched as something in her life began to change over the next couple of weeks. I watched that as when she was led into one of the darkest places of her life, God chose to flip the switch and ignite a spark, a spark that would, ign that would just catch like wildfire. It was amazing to watch, let me tell you. She, I watched as she invited friends that she hadn't seen for decades. I started seeing them come to our house for meals, and, and she started sharing the gospel of Jesus and, and what, what he had to offer for them. And, and I started seeing these friends that she hadn't seen forever become followers of Jesus. I started to see as my mom, she, she started reaching out to her family, her siblings, and I watched as those families be, started becoming Jesus followers as well. I watched as she started talking to our family, my siblings and my father, and, and I started to see the light that Jesus provides showing up in their lives as well. It was amazing who she spent time to reach out and share the light of Christ with. See, God graced my mom. He gifted her another two years of life when the doctors thought there was only a couple months. She became a light in her world. She started lighting up the places she went, something that God calls each and every one of us to be, back in Matthew 5.14. See, every day was a gift for my mom. 
Every day, uh, as Pastor Jed would say, is, was considered bonus round. It was a gift. It was extra. God had flipped on the switch. And he flips each one for us. Every day is bonus round for us. And every day we have the joy and grace that God gives of life. And he has given us hope beyond that, that this world isn't even our end. This is why we don't have hope in our circumstances, not the things of this world, not the people of this world, but rather the child who was born on Christmas. He was given as a gift to us because of this, even when things aren't great, we still celebrate. Now, I don't know how this message is going to affect you. I really don't. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He'll do that. But maybe, maybe for you this Christmas, it's going to be a hard one. And maybe not. You know, maybe for some of you, like, you're excited about Christmas. It's going to be great, and you're excited for everything that comes with it. You're excited for Christmas morning. You're excited about the eggnog and, and the Christmas gifts, and you're excited with the family, and everything sounds great, and you're super excited about it. Don't feel guilty about it. That's amazing. That's awesome. Accept that as the gift that it is, uh, and enjoy it. That's a blessing. But recognize that for some, this Christmas is not going to be as easy. It's not going to be an easy Christmas. Uh, maybe it's because of the pandemic. Maybe because of the pandemic, things are just going to be strange and weird, and it's just going to, it feels dark for some. They're not going to be able to see the family that they wanted to see, and, and it's just going to be difficult. Or maybe, maybe it's not pandemic, but maybe for you, maybe Christmas means you do have to go back to your family. And that means that you are going to be stuck sitting across from that person who hurt you in such a way that's unimaginable. And that feels dark. It feels like, I can't take that. It feels like such darkness to you. And if that's you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But maybe it's not that either. Maybe for you, this is the first Christmas that you're going to have without your loved one. This is the first Christmas that you have to experience what Christmas is like without someone who's always been there with you. And so Christmas brings up a lot of grief and sadness. I've been there. I'm sorry. Or maybe it doesn't have to do with the darkness of, of the time, but maybe it feels like right now, it just feels like your hope has been placed in the wrong thing. Maybe it was placed in a person, a boyfriend or a girlfriend that you thought would make your life better. A politician, a substance, something that you thought would make your life that much better and you thought for a little bit it felt like it did and it felt better and then you're back into the space of darkness. You think, where is my hope? When's this going to be better? Maybe it feels like this is a dark space and you're wondering where is that space and, and I want to invite you into the light that only Jesus can provide, that only God can provide. And if you're not sure how to do that, I, I, would, I would encourage you at today, do not leave this room in that darkness. Talk to somebody, whether, I don't, I don't care if it's me or if it's a staff, another person on staff or, or just a friend who brought you here or somebody else sitting in this room. Talk to somebody. Don't leave here today in that darkness. Jesus, see, he provides light of life and you can come to him. Jesus calls his followers to be the light on the hill, the lamp on the lampstand that can never be put out. He calls each and one of his followers to be bearers of this light, not of their own lights, but of light that he provides, the fuel that he gives and the reflection of his glory. You can spread that light to people. You can share this hope that only God provides. Don't let people walk in the darkness. Spread that light. Put the switch. Isaiah showed us that even when family life is weird, even when work life is weird, when school is weird, even when things feel dark and confusing, we still have a reason to celebrate. We still have hope. Not in our circumstances, not even in our timelines. Remember that when Isaiah wrote this passage, Jesus wouldn't be born for another 700 years. 
Yeah, God doesn't always work on our preferred timelines. In fact, sometimes it feels a little conceited for us to assume that we have the better timeline anyway, right? But God, he is definitely chosen to enter into the darkness with us. He has provided a light, a hope in Jesus that this world is not our end. He's done it before, and he'll do it again. Even when things aren't great, you can still celebrate. You have hope, and that's amazing. I'm going to pray for us, and then I'll invite the band back up, and we'll close. Bow your heads with me. God, I thank you for your promise to victory over death. And over the things of this world, God, we thank you that we can have hope because of your son, Jesus. Because you are a God who is faithful to us. You remind us, please God, today that you are faithful. Remind us of your faithfulness and that you do as you say you do. Allow us to continue to place our faith deeper and deeper into you because of that. God, you are so good and we thank you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us. say you are you'll do what you say you'll do you'll be who you've always been to us Jesus he's our hope our hope is in you alone Our strength in your mighty name, our peace in the darkest day remains, Jesus. This we know, we will see the enemy run, this we know, we will see the Jesus, you are unfailing. That's right. Our guide through the wilderness. Our joy in the heaviness. Oh, our way when it seems there is no way. Jesus. We trust you, oh, we trust you, your ways are higher than our own, oh, Jesus, we trust you, we trust you, your ways.
trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. Yes, we trust you. Jesus, we trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. We trust you in all things. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. Yes, we trust you. Oh, we trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. Hear these words of benediction. They come from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Have a great week.